In this video, we'll look at qubits, strange objects used to store information in a quantum computer. We'll also look at how you can manipulate a qubit by passing it through different logic gates. To start, let's review the workings of the qubit's simpler cousin, the classical bit. Bits in classical computing are objects that can either be in a state called 0 or a state called 1. All information in classical computing is stored using bits and they can be manipulated by passing them through logic gates. For example, the NOT gate turns a 0-bit into a 1-bit, and vice versa. Qubits, at first glance, appear rather similar. A measurement gate will inform us that a qubit is either 0 or 1. By using the quantum version of the NOT gate, labeled with the letter X, we can convert a qubit measured as 0 to a qubit measured as 1. Passing a qubit through a reset gate will cause it to always be measured as zero. However, the effects of quantum logic gates extend beyond what's possible with their classical counterparts. To see this, we'll experiment with a variety of additional gates that produce strange effects, revealing the true nature of qubits in the process. We'll start by focusing on the Atomar gate. If we reset a qubit, then send it through the Atomar gate, you find that half the time we measure it as zero and half the time, we measure it as 1. The same thing happens if we use a qubit starting in the 1 state. From this, it might seem like the H gate is just randomizing the qubit. If this was the case, we'd expect that two H gates in a row would have the same effect, the second gate just randomizing the qubit a second time. But when we perform this experiment, we find that the qubit is always measured as whatever it started as. What this tells us is that the qubit carries more information than just whether it's 0 or 1. More specifically, it's useful to say that in between the two H gates, the qubit remembers that it's in between the 0 and 1 states. A qubit with some kind of in-between state like this is said to be in a superposition. You can think of this notation as saying that this qubit is equally likely to be measured as 0 or 1 instead of just being 100% likely to be measured as 0, or 100% likely to be measured as 1. The H gate turns 0 and 1 qubits into two different kinds of superpositions, allowing the second H gate to correctly undo the effect of the first. Notice though that each of these superpositions have the same chances of being 0 and 1, explaining why we didn't notice this effect when we measured after the first H gate. Let's now use this effect to get a better understanding of measurement. Like we saw before, placing a measurement after an H gate produces random results. This makes some amount of sense because it's the most accurate picture we can get of the superposition with such a blunt measurement. Let's now try placing a few measurements in a row. Surprisingly, they always agree with each other. This tells us that the measurement isn't just randomly reporting some possible state each time. If it were, we'd expect the results of each gate to be uncorrelated. We'd expect each measurement to act like an independent coin flip, paying no attention to the other's results. This tells us that the measurement isn't just passively noting things down, but is actively changing the state of any qubit it touches, such that later measurements produce the same result. Specifically, the measurement gate works by randomly selecting one of the possible states, then making that the only possible state. This effect is called collapsing a superposition. The reason we still call this the measurement gate and not the collapsing gate is because there is no known way to directly measure the properties of a superposition without collapsing it. By doing this with a measurement gate, we learn what specific state the superposition collapsed to. This is also why we say that measurement is destructive. The process of measuring a qubit destroys some of the information it carries. This explanation suggests an interesting experiment to prove the properties we found. Before, we saw that passing a qubit through two Atomar gates causes it to remain unchanged. Let's see what happens when we put a measurement gate between the two H gates. Since the measurement collapses the qubit, we see that the second H gate now appears to randomize the qubit, just like the first. Recall that this mirrors the behavior we would expect if the H gate by itself acted like a randomizer. This tells us that the randomness we see is not a property of the H gate itself, but a property of measurement. Let's take a step back 
to formalize some of our definitions. The notation we've been using so far to represent the state of a qubit is called a block sphere, although we've been using it as more of a block square so far. This handy diagram represents all possible states a qubit can be in as points on a sphere. We usually draw an arrow from the center of the sphere to make the diagram easier to read. An arrow pointing up represents a qubit that will always be measured as zero, and an arrow pointing down represents a qubit always measured as one. In general, the likelihood of a qubit to be measured as zero or one is represented by how much its analogous block sphere is pointing in that particular direction. All the logic gates we've looked at, and the ones we have yet to cover, act analogously to some rotation on the block sphere. Because of this, it's helpful to label a few axes as points of reference. From this labeling, we can see where the X gate gets its name. Specifically, its function can be described as a half rotation around the X axis. Notice how this flips a zero qubit to one, and vice versa. This also tells us what happens in cases where the qubit is not exactly zero or one. The predictably named Y and Z gates perform the same function around their respective axes. More generally, we can talk about RX, RY, and RZ gates that rotate along these axes by some specific amount that we get to pick. For example, we could describe an RY gate that rotates by half a radian, or maybe an RX gate that rotates by negative three radians. Finally, the Atomar gate functions as a half rotation around this axis, between the X and Z axes. This half rotation gives us an intuition for why applying it twice seems to produce no change. In this video, we looked at the behavior of individual qubits, and how their states can be described by the block sphere. We also explored how a variety of quantum logic gates can be described as rotations on the block sphere, and how the measurement gate collapses qubits down to one of two states. The fact that individual qubits work in this way is pretty interesting, but by itself, it doesn't let us do anything that we can't do with regular computers. In the next video, we'll look at the workings of entanglement, and see how using multiple qubits at once lets us quickly perform operations on exponentially more data.